Christmas, Happy New Year almost. We have had quite a year, amen? <laughs> and uh, you know, I, uh, I love just stating the obvious, um, but I also want us to make sure that we're not moving into stating the obvious and then getting kind of old and tired of it all. Uh, because 2020 was a great year for many of you uh, because you drew closer to the Lord um, You found where uh, you needed to be. Uh, it was a challenging year um, It's been a lot on our hearts and on our minds and in the news and every day It just keeps like it keeps on hitting us, you know one more thing And so as we come together in church this morning as we come together to uh, thank God for his son uh, for our lives uh, for this fellowship, uh, I want to open our time together in prayer. Would you join me? Heavenly Father, you are good. Your mercies endure forever, and we're thankful that they're new every morning. We love you, and we feel ourselves becoming weary, and then your word resounds in our heart. And it reminds us that the most important things that are true are centered in who you are and who we can be because of that. And so we come together this morning and we thank you for all that 2020 has been as challenging, as disappointing, as shocking, and as even as blessings have come through this year. We, we just say thank you for all of that because it all should draw us closer to you. And so now in our time of continued worship and in this message, I pray that our hearts would be open. We have a lot on our mind. I pray that we could focus and truly be here together with one another and with you uh, this morning. In Jesus' name, everyone said... Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Oh, that's a women's ministry thing. Uh, <laughs> guys, you're welcome to participate with us. Um, I'm Jennifer Richmond. I'm one of the teaching pastors here. I'm usually with the kids down the hall and uh, with women and whatnot. But tomorrow, this morning, I get to be with you. Um, you're welcome, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so the Christmas story continues. We're going to move into another chapter together this morning. And if you want to, you can open up your Bibles to a Luke uh, chapter 2 or swipe open your, your apps and get ready for, for Luke 2. I'm going to start at about verse 39 if you want to head into there. Uh, you know, there's a couple few things in life that it's okay to lose, right? Like if you lose your keys, it's kind of expensive these days to replace them, but you probably could get a new you know, set of keys. Um, how many of you have lost your phone? Anyone? Lose your phone? <laughs> this morning, you can't find it still. Right? I know a lot of the guys out here like, I lost my hair. There's some things. That... Amen. Amen. Yeah. There's things you can lose, and it's okay. Joe will never lose his head. This is gonna, this is gonna be Joe forever. It's just gonna turn white, right? Now. All right. So there's, there's things you can lose in life that you're like, ah, oh, it's probably not the end of the world. But there are certain things you lose. You're like, ah, I probably shouldn't have been that way. Like a child, we shouldn't be losing our children. So that's a little hint on our today's story today. Um, but um, we don't want to lose kids, and yet. Um, that's exactly what happens in our story. Let's find out a little bit more about that. I hope you'll enjoy as we move through this passage. You know, after all the miraculous events uh, that we have been through, the angelic announcements, the powerful prophecies, the chapter in Jesus' life that we're going to go into touches a little bit closer to home and to reality because of the losing thing and that whole idea. And we start seeing the realness and the, the hominess and the earthliness of our amazing, miraculous Savior and Deliverer. And we get this peek into his life as a boy. And, and if you're like me, you're like, man, I wish there was more. But there's actually not. In fact, this chapter in Luke and one other small chapter in Matthew, this chapter, 52 verses, covers 30 years in the life of Jesus. 30 years in 52 verses. If you're like me, you kind of wish there would be like at least a chapter for every year of his life. So the only details that we get then about Jesus' childhood are in one verse, and it's Luke chapter 2, verse 40 on the slide here. And he grew, the child grew, and became strong and filled with wisdom, and favor of God was upon him. And that verse covers birth through 12 years of his life. So if you're taking notes, you like little timelines, you can draw a line and start putting dots uh, right there on the timeline, boom. Or if you're taking notes in your Bible, that's, that's the 12 year mark, <laughs> zero to 12, verse 40. And we fill in the blanks then in our own mind with what we know it's like to, to be a kid, to grow up, 
We also know that Jesus, of course, was a baby, and then he became a, a toddler. He didn't just like, boom, become a full-grown man. He was a young child, like you were. He was a kid, he was a preteen, he was a teenager. He was God incarnate, though. He was God incarnate. Jesus was fully God, and he was fully man. He wasn't fully man, and then along the way, he became more and more God. He was born fully God and fully human. John said in the next slide, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. If Jesus was only God, then there's no way for him to have been tempted and not sin. If he was only a man, then there would have been no way for him to have perfectly and righteously fulfilled the law on our behalf as our representative. He had to be a man to do that. Hebrews 4.15 says that Jesus in every respect was tempted as we are and yet without sin. And in Hebrews 5, 8, he says he learned obedience from the things that he suffered. He learned obedience. The God, the creator of the universe, had things to learn as a man. He had to learn obedience. Think about this. Those of you who've been around or have your own children, Jesus was two years old. He was the terrible two? No. He was tempted to throw a tantrum. He didn't demand his own way. He overcame that. He was tempted then later on to uh, give into sin as a pre-teenager, but he overcame that. He was tempted in every way like we are. And I think sometimes you read that verse and think, well, the, I, as a grown-up, sure. And we think of him and the temptations and Satan and all that interaction. But he was a baby. And he had to grow. And it was true that then that he was tempted in every way like we are. Think of the ways that you were tempted when you were a kid. And some of you are still kids. Some of you still act like kids. <laughs> Joke. But listen, listen. He, he was tempted in every way like we are. That means he grew up as a child. And this is important because a lot of false religions... They teach that Jesus came into perfection later in life into some kind of divine encounter or that he had some sort of an awakening moment when he decided to take on the role of a Messiah figure. You know, false religions and cults, they always strike at the core truth of the identity of Jesus Christ. Jesus was a God, the Jehovah's Witnesses say. Jesus was Satan's brother, the Mormons will tell you. Jesus was God functioning as a man, right? You know, if there was a cult starter kit that you could order on Amazon, don't, 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 don't look that up right now, by the way. <laughs> Over here, I'm on you, you're laughing too loud. He's like, I'm gonna check that out. What? Same day shipping? All right, it's like the drones delivering it outside the church. If you could order a cult starter kit, it would arrive with start here directions. Jesus is not God. It's like the common theme to all the cults. So listen, what we're going to see in this passage are the only words recorded from Jesus in 30 years. 30 years of his life go by, and the only words that we have recorded of Jesus are in the passage we're going to look at today. That's when you all go, what? Wow. Woo. I'm used to teaching with the kids, you know. Listen. We're going to hear this one truth loud and clear. Jesus is God, and Jesus knew that he was God. It didn't occur to him later in life. He knew he was God. So we pick up now in verse 41 of Luke chapter 2, and it's springtime in Israel. And we know this because, verse 41, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And Passover is an annual feast, and it takes place every year in late March, early April on our calendar. And every year his parents, it says, made that trip to Jerusalem. So Jesus grew up going on that journey, right? Over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house to go, but only it's to his father's house he went, right? 30 years of Jesus' life are going to pass recorded in basically two verses. Verse 40, just said it, and then we're going to take a jump and we're going to go to verse 52 with this one incident we're going to hear about this morning. And that's all we get. All we know about Jesus from his purification to the time that he's baptized is this account. John said, 
And maybe this resonates with each one of us as we hear John's words at the end of his gospel. He says, now there are many other things that Jesus did where every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that could be written. Wow, I wanna go to that library where it's the every aisle is just all about Jesus. That would be amazing. And John, John didn't even record the birth of Jesus. Think about that. And I share all this just to keep us in awe and also in appreciation for what we do know. What God shows to give us in his word is what we need to know. And we can be assured of that. So what do we learn in this account? Verse 42. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. For 12 years, Jesus had been growing, playing, learning, watching, laughing, being tempted, and obeying. People might say, you know, kids these days, right? You know, and grumble how things are with this next upcoming generation, or millennials these days, or fill in the blank with whatever, right? But I guarantee you, there were old men back in Jesus' day, get off my lawn, you know? <laughs> and, and, and saying the same things about kids these days, okay? And then Jesus came along. You know, at 12, that you can also surprise your teachers with your maturity. The Proverbs said, even a child is known by the things that he does, and a child who loves God's word can be wiser than his teachers, it says in Psalm 119. At 12, you can amaze your parents with your thoughtfulness. At 12, at 13, 10, 16, however old young people are right now, listen, you have available to you the same power and wisdom that the adults do in your life. You have the same 24 hours in the day to get up, to be strong, to think big thoughts, to grow in your faith, to change the world. You know, there's future doctors and teachers and chefs and painters and all in this room is filled with all that potential. But young people, listen, and where are you? Where's my young people? A bunch of them here, a couple guys over here, a guy back there. Listen, I'm gonna talk to you guys for a second here. Whatever you end up doing, whatever you consider being, when somebody asks you that question and aren't you getting like, I don't wanna hear that again. What do you wanna be when you grow up? Anyone, All right? Here's what you can always be sure. I'm gonna be on a mission for God. Doesn't matter what you grow up. Doesn't matter what you get paid to do. Be on a mission for God no matter what. There's a lot going on in the world today, amen? There's a lot of things that can make you afraid or depressed or confused or disconnected, but let me just tell you right now, you're not alone, kids. You're not alone. You're surrounded by men and women around you in this room right here who want the best for you. And that best is this, no matter what happens, no matter what you decide to be when you grow up, or if you never feel like you can ever even figure out what you want to be when you grow up. Some of the adults are like, yeah, I'm like me. <laughs> you can give your life to Jesus Christ right now, wherever you are, whether you're a kid, a teen, a young adult, you can grow in wisdom and favor with God and do bigger and do braver things than you ever thought possible. And there's distractions to that level of excellence. Some of you are caught up in some of those distractions. You're caught up in the dumb drama of typical teenage issues. You're addicted to online games or worse. Some of you are just lazy. <laughs> some of you kids are just disrespectful and you chew with your mouth open. Some of you are disrespecting to your parents in your life and it's time to step up and move on and stop making excuses. Stop ignoring what you know to be true. You're just a kid. No, stop. Jesus was just a kid. Growing up, this is for you as well. Oh, my life. Oh, it's over. Oh, I'm doing this now. I never had a chance. Stop. All of us need to take seriously our faith and our relationship with Jesus Christ and live by his example. And it's set forth in us in the passage we're looking at this morning. Jesus is not some guy that you just hear about in church. He's God, <laughs> and he has a plan, and he has a mission for your life, for my life, for our life, for this church. Coming to church, going to youth group, that is a great place to start. Own it on the other days as well. Ask your parents for a Bible. Dust off the Bible you were given when you got baptized as a kid. Get an app on your phone. Read the word. Read it with your parents. Read it on your own. Get a friend to read it with you. Get serious about your future. Young people, you're the future of this church. You're going to be the elders and the deacons. And we're excited about that. You guys are awesome. I love having you help in children's ministries, and I see you out there at youth group. This is going to be an amazing group of young adults as you kids keep growing. And I'm praying for that, and I know Pastor Joe is as well. But 12-year-olds can do exactly that, and you can start doing that today. 
So here we have preteen Jesus, sinless God in flesh, whose body and his mind have developed and become strong and wise, and God's favor is on him, and he's doing and he's done with his family for 12 years. He's walking to Jerusalem for Passover to sacrifice a lamb. Listen, the same Passover that he will walk every year of his life. And in 21 years from this moment, in this passage, mark it in your Bible, he's going to become that Passover lamb. Only at this moment, he's just a boy, wise beyond his years, aware of his mission. A sinless child in verse 40. And if you look at the wording, verse 43, a boy. Leave home, child, arrive, boy. 43. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy, Jesus, stayed behind in Jerusalem. When the feast was ended, that's Luke's way of saying that his parents were doing their job well. They stayed for the entire feast, which was eight days in Jerusalem. They would have arrived with a caravan of families. They would have got a lamb to be sacrificed. They would have come together for a Passover meal. They would have eaten that lamb dinner, and then they would have headed back home to Nazareth. And you can tell that they trusted their son Jesus because they don't even notice that he stayed behind. I mean, caravans traveling for the feast, they would have had large groups of men in the back, and then the ladies in the middle, and then the, the kids scampering around in the front somewhere. Joseph might have been with the guys and Jesus in the back. He might have been Jesus might have been with Mary in the middle. They weren't sure, but they didn't think about it because they trusted Jesus. They thought he was with him, but, next verse, his parents did not know it, verse 44, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. The trip from Nazareth to Jerusalem would have taken about four days. They had eight days for this full Passover. Now they begin their four-day journey back. And so one day in on that journey, or about 20 miles, they realize Jesus is not with them. Now, some of you have left your kids' places, but a whole day? 20 miles? Joseph and Mary... They began to search for him among their relatives and their acquaintances. They thought for sure he must be with them. Jesus, who was never one time in his life had ever disobeyed them. Jesus, who had never argued. He had never talked back. He was never lazy. In any way, they could possibly have thought that he could have done something wrong to be missing. He must be where he should be, they were thinking. And that's with us, his parents. Clearly, that's what's on their mind as they keep on searching. But throughout the caravan, I'm sure they called his name out and in and out of, of every group. And you can feel the panic and the, the energy building because you've lost a kid before or your keys or your phone. And you know it doesn't feel good to lose that. They're getting more and more frantic and they're searching in the caravan and they find Finally decide to head back up the hill to Jerusalem verse 45 and when they did not find them they returned to Jerusalem searching for him Jerusalem literally means city of peace Joseph and Mary were feeling no peace at all as they hurry back because they still didn't find Jesus right away we oh, had one job <laughs> One job, take care of the king of the universe. <laughs> Keep an eye on the prince of peace. Don't lose the savior. They had arrived and they had survived their journey to Bethlehem when Jesus was born, right? They kept him safe from that crazy, murderous Herod by escaping to Egypt. And now this? <laughs> but after not one, not two, but three full days, next verse 46, they found him where? in the temple, the temple where they had been, the temple where the lambs had been sacrificed for Passover, the temple now where Jesus is doing what? Playing around with the other kids these days, um, running around trying to find his parents, hanging out like teens do at a mall. I'm sure they did that back then too. We don't do that anymore, I think. But anyway, no, the savior of the world, the light of the Gentiles, the greatest of all the rabbis, this young preteen Jesus was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Sitting, listening, asking. If we're to be imitators of Christ, then we can begin here. Because these three words are the first words to describe any action of Jesus. And the only actions that we know about from the time that he's 12 to the time of his next action, submission. Sitting. That's respectful. He's not standing. He's not pacing. He's not preaching. He's not demanding attention. Hey, you. <laughs> I wrote that scroll. <laughs> I know the number of hairs on your, not you, on your head. 
I'm on a roll with the bald thing, sorry. <laughs> no, that's not Jesus. He's a humble servant. The word that became flesh is setting the example for those who have ears. Let them hear. He's the one listening. Why would the word become flesh need to listen to anyone? Why would the God who spoke the world into existence need to hear even one word spoken? Because Jesus grew and became strong. And that's how it's done. You listen because Jesus learned obedience and that's how it's done. You listen. You want to be like Jesus? You listen to good teachers. You get to the feet of those who've gone before you and are in the word. Young people, you don't know it all. Old people, you don't know it either, even though you realize at this point you don't know it all. We all need to be like Jesus. We all must then listen at the feet of wise teachers. And he asked questions. Asked questions. What kind of questions could Jesus have asked? I mean, I could think of a million questions that I would like to ask Jesus, and I can imagine a million more that those teachers would have asked if they only knew who they were talking to, right? But if you want to be like Jesus, then you need to engage like him. Ask questions. Seek to understand. Be attentive. Don't sit here on Sunday after Sunday letting the messages float over you. Bring them in. Think about them. Chew on it. Engage with us. And save all your tricky questions for Job. Verse 47, and all who were amazed at his understanding and his answers, they were all amazed. That means that when he asked questions, he grasped their answers, and then he had answers for them as well, and it stunned all of them. The Amplified Bible, I don't put it on the screen, but it reads like this, Amplified Bible. He says, they were astonished and overwhelmed with be bewildered wonder at his intelligence and understanding his, re his replies. And while he's still there at their feet, engaging with the rabbis, the astonishment continues. Verse 48, his parents saw him, they were astonished. You know, Mary is taking this all very personally, and you can relate. When you finally find a lost child, your emotions are this frantic mix of relief and even some anger, right, for everything that you've been through <laughs> and how emotionally exhausting it is, right? All that worry, three days. Yes, interesting, isn't it? That Jesus was missing for three days when all along he was right where he needed to be. Do you recall the prophecy of Simon when Jesus was presented at the temple? Jesus would have been 40 days old. Simon held him and he wept with joy. And then he turned to Mary. And what did Simon say at the end to Mary? And a sword will pierce through your own soul also. If there was dramatic music playing, it would have been lilting and lovely at the beginning as Simon is giving this prophecy and then he turns his attention to Mary and a sword's going to pierce your soul and the music would have shifted to with this dark, somber, like, wait, what? I can only imagine how Mary must have felt so pierced in her soul about all this. Hurt and scared and confused she lays on what these days we might call Jewish mother guilt. <laughs> and she lays it on thick when she says, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And you can just feel it dripping with true, sincere drama and angst. It's been 12 years, and Jesus has literally been the perfect child. We all might think we'd like to raise the perfect child. Some of us might think we actually are raising the perfect child. Meet me in Sunday school, I'll tell you. <clears throat> <laughs> but Jesus haven't given them a moment of worry or had been a disappointment in any way to his parents, and now here they are, and it's no private incident. Think about this. Today we call it mom shaming. When internet moms judge other moms who have no idea what's really going on, Mom guilt is terrible on its own in our own hearts, but imagine how other it must have been scorning them. Oh, there's Mary and Joseph trying to find that kid who looks so perfect. <laughs> I guess there's trouble in the carpenter's house after all, mm -mm -mm, right? The entire caravan would have known that Jesus was missing. The whole of Jerusalem might have heard their frantic cries for him. All the rabbis now knew and were witness to the first time that Mary's heart was pierced by the sword, fulfilling that word from Simon. Because Jesus had caused her such distress 
stop and think, listen, be honest. Has Jesus done that to you? Have you been distressed about what's going on in your life in this world? Is there a way in which maybe like Mary and Joseph, you are feeling like you're going about your life and you are doing the right things only to have your life feel like it's completely out of control? Mary and Joseph had been doing literally the exact right thing. They've been teaching Jesus, like Proverbs says, in the way he should go. They had been to Jerusalem every year in obedience to the Torah. They listened to and they honored the prophets and the angels and the prayers. Mary had, Luke said in chapter 2, verse 19, treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. But still, here she was with an astonished, stressed, anxious heart after doing all the right things. Are you open to the possibility that there's things beyond your understanding? We get the overall big view of Mary. We know how it's going to end, but you're in the middle of your life story right now. Do you? No. Are you willing to come frantically then to Jesus with your shock and your distress and your dif disbelief over what you've been through? Are you thinking back through this year and how 52 weeks ago we popped the cork on what seemed to be the turn of a new decade and nothing but blue skies ahead only to have the entire year leave you and so many others feeling lost and stunned and even angry and disappointed? Are you, are we willing to experience all that and still hear, listen, words like what Mary heard next, verse 49, and he said to them, why are you looking for me? <laughs> Ouch. I mean, are you kidding me? Of all the responses, he turns their question back to them. And having asked and answered every question of every rabbi for three days, he's asked a question filled with emotion and drama and anxiousness. And his response is, ah, oh, I'm so sorry, mom. I should have sent a camel with a message for you, you know? His response, his respectful, perfect, sinless, humble response to Mary, his own mother, whose soul had once magnified the Lord, was, where else did you think I would be? <laughs> wow. Awesome. <laughs> Is Jesus always where he should be? Shine. Yes. Does he always do what he needs to be done? Yes. Then right here is where Mary begins to let go and truly live out what she told the angel. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And that wasn't just about getting pregnant with the Savior of the universe. That was everything. Because it's one thing to say it or sing it or even pray it, and it's another thing altogether to live it. Did Mary mean those words back then? Of course she did. I believe so. Did Mary know, as the song says? Mary, did you know? I believe she did know. But now Mary no knows, you know? And we can only get to that place when we let go of the Jesus that we want and we look to the Jesus that actually has been given because Jesus' reply didn't end there. What Jesus says next is the reminder to us all, this is no preteen wannabe prophet. This is God incarnate. Jesus said, next verse, do you not know that I must be in my father's house? Mary had literally just said, your father and I have been looking for you. And Jesus, in one rhetorical question, corrects her and, ladies, tightens her theology. Bible study ladies, right? We talked about that. Tightens her theology. In the only words recorded of him in 30 years tells us who he was and why he came. Very simple statement. I must be in my father's house. Jesus is saying, you should have come here first. He's going to say this again in 18 years at another Passover when he clears the temple with a whip and he shouts to them, don't make my father's house a house of trade. Mary and Joseph knew the temple belonged to God, and that's where Jesus was. They knew exactly who Jesus was referring to. He was saying, God is my father. I'm the son of God. He's reminding them of what they already knew. You know who my father is. You know this is my true house. I don't really belong in your house in Nazareth. God is my true father. I belong with his people in his house. 
ouch, ouch. Luke, by recording this moment, is making it clear who Jesus Christ is. Angels, men, Satan, demons all testified that Jesus was the Son of God. And here is Jesus in his first and only words recorded in 30, how many? 30 years. And his own testimony centers on that truth. Jesus is claiming God as his personal father. The Jews, they saw God as the father of the universe. They spoke of God as the father of Israel. But to say God is my father, no one spoke of God like this. Jesus had a mission and a purpose far above what we may feel that our emotional needs require. Does he care? Of course he does. Is he able to sympathize? Yes, he can even empathize because he suffered and through that suffering learned obedience. But what Jesus has to teach us, the most significant thing that we can know, listen, it isn't how to soothe our anxious hearts when we're upset at our world or our friendships or our children's behavior or our marriages. In a moment when Jesus could have revealed himself as the great comforter, the one upon whom we can cast our burdens, the healer of our hearts and our mind, the way maker providing peace that can guard our hearts. All those things are true. The most important thing, though, that he can begin with is this. Know who I am. That should be our most centering, anxiety-reducing, faith-building, reality check of them all because that's exactly what he gave to his own anxious mother and earthly father. This is who I am. And get that straight, and all those roads will lead from there to home. And that's exactly what happens next. They went home to Nazareth. But listen, they didn't have some dynamic aha moment when it all fell into place, and they totally get it. That's how I would have written the story. That's how any of us would. Oh, man, thanks, Jesus. Totally get it now. <laughs> no, listen to what Luke records next, verse 50. And they did not understand the things that he spoke to them. <laughs> And get used to that phrase. Get used to it because it's going to repeat a lot in the Gospels. And Jesus says or does something, everyone's astonished, and no one quite gets what's happening. And when you think of it, Jesus is still only 12 years old. This is all just beginning for Jesus. He's got 18 years of continuing to grow and to learn. But right here at the feet of the rabbis in the shadow of the temple, the floor plan, by the way, that he did design, the 12-year-old Jesus is stating his identity and his mission I'm the son of God, and my priority is doing my father's will. Because even after that moment on the steps of the temple, they all had to travel back with that young Jesus, their son, and get on with just basic life moments. Verse 51, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was, what, submissive to them. Jesus was submissive. Another verb, another action of Jesus. That means he kept the commandments. He kept the fifth commandment. He kept the first. He kept the second. He kept them all. All the commandments. His earthly parents, his sinful, mistake-prone, worrying parents, Jesus submitted to them. Kids, are you listening? Submit to your parents. Obey your parents. They're a train wreck. We get it. <laughs> Submit to them. Listen to them anyway. You're a train wreck too. We all are. Yay, Jesus. Okay. Amen. <laughs> Jesus took out the trash, cleaned his room, did his Torah studies, right? And for a second time, Luke records something special about the character and the nature of Mary, and his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Did she understand it all? No. Well, she did what she could. She raised Jesus according to the word. She treasured in her heart things she could grasp and many things she couldn't quite get in verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom. See what happens when you listen, and you sit, and you wait? and you submit. Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And it's interesting how this passage finishes. His relationship with his father, it grew. It grew stronger to the point where one day he said, Father, if there is any other way, let this cup depart from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus' first recorded words point us to the mission that he must be about. And among his final words, we hear his own anxious heart, must I take this cup? Must this be the way? And because Jesus did grow in wisdom and in stature, he knew his father's will must be done, that he would die to fulfill his father's will so that you, so that I could have life. He died in our place. He took his sins upon himself, and yet because of his father's will, 
of his longing to be in his father's house and to have you and to have me there with him in his father's house, he died so that the end result is that we will be in our father's house forever. In a moment, we're going to have a time to worship and remember that final moment that our Savior, Jesus, grew to become the man who died for us, shed his blood for us. Worship in this moment. I know you still have a lot on your mind. I know your lists, you're like me, and you're thinking, can we worship church? Can we be present in this moment and just give it to the Lord right now as we, as we turn our hearts to communion? Can you set your heart right before God at the close of the year and the beginning of a new year? Confess, declare, I need you, Lord. I need you. I need you now more than ever. And let this final Sunday of the year be the moment when you declare that you accept what you cannot fully understand, that you receive what you can never deserve, the love and the sacrifice and the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Please stand with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, <laughs> thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you sit and listen and grow and that we can do that as well in your name. Lord, let us be a church that is defined by its deepest love for you. That we would truly know your word, that we would love you, that we would be on fire to transform our community because we get it. You're a great God, your amazing love, and we need you now more than ever. We come to you right now. We're humble before you. We take this communion. We drink this cup. We eat this bread, and we remember your love and your sacrifice and that we're nowhere if we don't have that. So we give this time now of worship into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.